So data and what has previously been called big data, but I think just a lot of data is navigating over towards being larger in size. The reason why we are running into issues with computational analysis now is that we have increased data collection, storage, and analytical power. So when we were first trying to resolve the genome, we were actually struggling to handle how much data we had. So if you remember back, I'll give a bit of an introduction, but it was an international effort to sequence the first human genome. We broke it up into small chunks and distributed amongst universities around the world to try and help it get analyzed so we could do kind of like a parallel processing. But back then we were actually sending hard drives in the mail and we were restricted to how much we could save on a hard drive. Now we have cloud storage, very large storages that are very quick and easy to access. Previously, if you're trying to do some computation on like a very old hard drive, um, it would take a while for you to access the data, do some computation and store that. But now we can access web servers lightning fast. So some of the data that we see kind of increasing in availability now are patient records, wearable devices. So if you have an Apple Watch, they have warnings for you if they notice that your heart rate is irregular or elevating. That's constantly recording and measuring and analyzing your data so it can make these calls to communicate with you. So a lot of information coming out of those services as well. And I think a classical example that a lot of uh, people are intersecting with here, probably less so microarrays these days, but RNA sequencing, whether it be bulk seq or single cell seq, lots of data, a lot of complexity, and a lot of choices to make when you are analyzing these types of data. So with the increase of size and complexity, I would also say increase affordability. You no longer need access to a specialized supercomputer to analyze large data. Standard laptop will do. When I'm teaching in my courses, people are doing it on their like iPads and stuff. If I have it hooked up to a server, you don't need a lot of expensive devices and it's not as expensive to store and access your data as well. Oh, whoops. I always love going back to the human genome project as somebody who's worked with a lot of genomic pro um, projects, but also just like as a comparison point for the speed at which we can go through analyses now. So the Human Genome Project began in 1990, which is in the scope of scientific history relatively recent. The idea was conceived in 1990 and it was first published in 2001. So the whole genome was resolved in about 10 years. It had, it was one of the only projects to my knowledge that actually finished early and under budget, but it still took so much money and international effort of many people collaborating together for us to get this completed. So it still took 13 years, but it was actually before the schedule uh, time and budget. Even though it was in the 1990s, they actually already budgeted about three to five of the annual budget to investigate the legal, uh, socioeconomic impacts of resolving the genome with anticipation that what they were doing by resolving the genome and having access to this information would be um, would have a very large impact in how we conduct science and how science interacted with society. So even if you think about whose genome was first sequenced, who do we have as a reference point for the perfect person, right? This is a reference to which we are comparing ourselves to. And there were a lot of discussions about whether we should be blending samples to get um, an average, what kind of like ethnicity, what age, where do they live? Um, now, nowadays, we have access to many different reference genomes. So if you're trying to pick a more normal representation of an average, you can pick some a, a demographic that is maybe closer to the population you're studying with. But this was the first one, and it took over a decade to do. Nowadays, you can walk across the street in Toronto, find a facility. They'll do it for like $500 over the weekend, right? a lot more accessible. No longer is it taking that much time to collect the data, now it's analyzing. Many of you guys have expressed that you have frustrations with bioinformatic cores or bioinformaticians that you've worked with, that it takes a lot of time to get your data back and to mine through it and make sure it's done well. Unfortunately, we're not gonna give them a run for their money with this two-day workshop, right? Um, 
I always try to introduce um, bioinformatics, especially in a workshop like this, in which this is your first time encountering R for many of you. If I was to take a Spanish two-day workshop, and I know nothing about Spanish, um, I wouldn't be able to speak to a native Spanish speaker. After a two-day workshop, I probably wouldn't be able to de novo make my own sentences if I wanted to. I'm hoping that I'll pick up a few nouns, understand their sentence structure so that if somebody is speaking Spanish to me, I can pick out a few words and try and understand what they're saying, but I'm no means fluent by the end of these two days. So similarly, this is the first time many of you guys are interacting with R. R is a new language. We're learning to speak to your computer. We're giving it commands, understanding its output. It is a two-way communication. And it will be challenging at times. I also think that in contrast to learning different biology topics, if you think back to like undergrad labs, we do make sure that everything works out very well for you. And there's like, this is a data set. We know that this is what happens when I give you these samples and this experiment to walk it through. 100% the first thing that I ask you to type, there will be an error message. <laughs> there will be typos and that is normal. So it's frustrating because this is the first time that you're probably gonna be hit with this many failures at once, but try and reframe your mind that getting these error messages is just our brute way of talking to you and getting you some feedback about what you're trying to tell them. It's not a reflection of you and your skill as a programmer or a budding bioinformatician. It's normal. Even as somebody who has coded for decades, error messages, are constant and there's not a day that or not even like an hour that I go through without an error message. It's 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 a problem solving puzzle. I know it's like it gives it back to you in a scary way because it commonly comes out in red and it's like kind of flaring at your face and it's hard to understand at first. But as part of what we're trying to get used to today is understanding how R is communicating with you. But being able to uh, understand the human genome was very revolutionary to medicine as it opened the door to a lot of different experiments, drug discovery, understanding more complex traits. So this was our like bump up after Mendelian genetics, right? Uh, allowed us access to a lot more information. And now we're moving into that realm of personalized medicine. There are a lot of languages for you to choose. You have chosen R. Um, and a question that I always get is, should I learn R or Python? Um, whatever you choose, just pick one and go with it. I mostly code in R, I have done some Python. R is the one that makes more sense to me. Um, in the science realm, we tend to have a lot of specialized packages for analyzing uh, genomic data, sequencing data that is built for R. So it is more seamless, in my opinion, to be doing it. But anything that I teach you today, you can do in Python. Anything Python does, I can do in R. But for me, it's faster to write more code in R than to learn a new language and get it done in Python. So. If you find that you're not really vibing with R at the end and you wanna try Python and that makes more sense to you, go for it. And there's not a right or right, wrong answer in whether I should do R or Python. They're just two different languages that will get you to the end. Take a look at if you're doing something very specialized, there might be some tools that are built specifically to R or Python that will help you along the way, but it's by no means a mistake if you pick one or the other. R does have its roots in more of a statistical language. So if you're doing a lot of statistical analysis, for example, clinical data, which in which you're doing a lot of comparison between clinical groups, R will have a lot of tools that are very um, helpful to that and will support you so you don't have to build things from the ground up. Along with the statistical side, it does have very powerful visualizations. And R has an initiative to try and make sure that they have transparent, and reproducible, reliable uh, visualization tools so that it can help with the communication as well. R was started by Robert Gentleman and Ross Ihaka. So um, I believe it was, I think it was Robert Gentleman. One of these individuals actually went on to be the director for 23andMe um, for a while. He's no longer there, but that really just shows the strength in R and the genomic information that we're having and its role in the world right now for computational biology. 
So with them starting R, they did nod to R with their first names for uh, naming this programming language, but it was also a callback because it's based on a lot of statistical languages like um, C that helped build the foundation. The reason why I think R is good for beginners is it has relatively clear grammar rules. I know you might not believe me, um, but it is a little bit more human readable compared to Python. It's object oriented, meaning that we save information into an, uh, an object. So if I name an object Francis and I give it a value of 100, there's like a virtual object named Francis in my environment that I can recall back to with that value. And I can act on it, I can change the storage, but it gives it a little bit, it's a little bit easier to visualize since we have these like virtual objects in the environments that we can recall and act on. It's very customizable. So we have packages that are built for specific tools and really, really helpful is a very large and active user group. So for these first two days, especially if this is your first time playing with R, I promise you, you will not break it in a way that somebody else has not done before. So when you get your error messages and you think it's beyond repair, I promise you it's not. Um, for these first two days, especially, even I tell my students in like the first semester of learning it, R has been gone through so much user testing because a lot of people use it. So we can help you out um, along the way. Even when you get into these larger projects, such as analyzing RNA-seq, you don't want to start at the bottom and just start building code. First thing you should do is go online and see who has done something similar and adapt it. So it's really helpful to getting kickstarted in different projects. Now, along with R, we're also going to be using R Studio. R Studio is an integrated development environment. This is, uh, I think, recently renamed as Post-it. So you might hear or refer to as uh, from the Post-it universe. <clears throat> you, we will also be using Tidyverse, which is a group of packages that are from R. And I will clarify the term packages and functions in a moment. Um, but you'll hear the word, word tidy, tidyverse a lot. It's their version of kind of packages in a multiverse that creates um, different functionalities. But R Studio is a wrapper. R Studio still runs the language of R within it. So R Studio being an integrated development environment means that you can run R code and Python code in it. You can run bash scripts, you can go through your terminal. So that's the reason why they're moving away from the word RStudio to where it's posted because they wanna make it more universal to the different languages. It's easier than running R from your terminal in just a command console because it helps us with what we call syntax highlighting. So things that are objects that have values inherently stored in them will be colored one way, functions will be colored another way. So you can easily, more easily tell what you're working with and it really helps you identify any typos. So it also highlights your brackets. Brackets always have to be in pairs. You cannot run code if you're missing one of them. And this, because there's special coloring around it, will help you identify um, any errors if you have in that. It also helps us manage multiple projects. So when I'm doing some analysis on my own time and teaching a course in R, I don't want the objects interfering with each other. So you can run two different projects. So if you're analyzing data from two different projects, sometimes if I'm helping a friend with their data, I don't want their objects to interact with each other, then you can run kind of two instances. You can think about it like two windows so that there's not the interference. Another popular environment you'll hear about is Jupyter Notebooks. This one was kind of the Python equivalent in which there was a lot more Python coding in Jupyter Notebooks originally, but same thing, you can run R code, um, bash scripts in it as well. Jupyter Notebook has an advantage in that you can more easily, in my opinion, uh, host it online on servers. So when I'm teaching to a thousand students, I do host Jupyter Notebook so that I can push that same notebook out to everybody. But in my opinion, I would recommend if you're analyzing data on your own machine, our studio is better for an individual experience. Although you may need to go to terminal if you're doing something that is very competentially, computationally expensive. So to wrap this together, 
my analogy for these two is even if you're teaching someone how to like write an essay in English, the language is English, but you still need something on your computer to write in English. So you would need Microsoft Word or an equivalent. Even though I'm teaching you the language R, you still need something to write R code in. That's going to be our R Studio. So there is, they, they work hand in hand together, but the language that you're coming out of here with is R. We're using R Studio to write that code. Once you write your R Studio code, the R code itself can be translated to different things like Terminal um, or Jupyter Notebook. What we're using is R Markdown, so it's, it's like a flavor of it. It takes a little bit more work to translate over to other systems, but I think it's a lot easier for you to see like the steps that we go through. So I'm gonna take a pause here for a moment. Are there any questions that I can clarify before I continue on with, with more intro R? Our console, yeah, uh, let me see if I have that. Uh, so I'll get into this in a moment, but this is what our studio looks like. There is a console in one of the panels of our studio. I'll get into more detail on this in a second. The console is the actual like brain of our studio. So when you're running code, it's going through the console, but we also have a script, which is like our notepad, our sketchpad. So we can temporarily write code, try it out, see if it works, push it to the console so it actually executes, but we still have a record of the code in the script. So the console is like the working brain. If you distill it down, that's where the real R is executing in our studio. Yeah, so in this image, you would replace our studio as like your equivalent to Microsoft Word. You would be writing code, you would be writing our code in a Jupyter notebook. So most of the time, Jupyter notebook is hosted online. It doesn't need to be cloud, so I can, but you would need, it's generally run through like a web browser, so you have to write your code in there, but you can still execute it on data that's just on your local device. For my example that I was running it with my class of 1000, I didn't want them to each have to download the data and then work with version issues, so they were writing code at home, and when they pushed it to the console to execute, that command would go to the server at our university, run, and then give them back the output. But you don't have to go through a cloud server. You can run it locally as well. But it, I, I don't think you need internet access. But it does run through a browser. Yeah. <laughs> I th I would say like R Studio's origin is R. Jupyter Notebook's origin is Python. But both can run both. Yeah. Yeah. Both can run both now. Um, in there is our studio online. That would be their equivalent kind of competitor to Jupyter Notebook. Yes. I would, I think it's gone through a lot of improvements recently, but I found it a little bit more clunky to work with um, because Jupyter Notebook is still more text-based, but you'll see in our studio, there's a lot of like graphical interface or like buttons that you can pick. And it's almost like remote accessing a desktop where there's a little bit of lag. And for me, it's a little bit more annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you for the great questions, everyone. So for these workshop objectives, we have a lot of tangible things that we want to be able to do at the end of them, interacting with R, understanding how data is stored, how we can work with it. Visualization is a key one, making plots to understand our data a bit more. And tomorrow we'll be getting more into more of the stats, linear regression, and applying some of these commands. Aside from these, I want to focus on the, like the three at the bottom. So conceptually, what we're going to get out of this at the end of the two days is get used to typing with 100% accuracy. This is something that we don't do in our normal lives, right? We rely on autocorrect on our phones. When we're writing essays, we just hash out our thoughts and then go back and remake perfect sentences, or at least close to perfect sentences. 
code will not run unless it's 100% correct. And that's frustrating. We need to make every line work before we can get to the next one. The structure of these two days is going to be code along. So we have some documents that we're sharing with you and we'll be writing code together. At the start, unless you are somebody who does a lot of computer work, it'll probably be very frustrating when we're typing along and you'll feel like you're going very slowly. You'll feel like you're doing a lot of typos and that is normal. If you are not, if you feel like I'm going, um, if you feel like there's a problem that you cannot solve within maybe like five attempts, that's when you need to flag over our TAs. I don't want you guys to fall behind because it's a code along. The next step is going to depend on the steps that we previously have done. So we have three amazing TAs here to help keep you on track. We'll go through like the flag system in a moment, but uh, I will go through it a little bit slow. You can definitely give me some feedback throughout the day if I'm going too quickly. Um, but we have to go through everything with 100% accuracy in order for R to understand what we're doing. Learning to interpret warning or error messages. Sometimes I also hear from students um, when they ask me a question and I Google something because it's a different package that I haven't used, a function I haven't used before. They're like, how did you know what to Google? That's something that also just takes practice to learn and get used to. Like we're understanding how R is talking to us, Google also has its own way of thinking. Um, and at the end of this workshop, I hope you feel comfortable and encouraged to explore R and programming. So notice, I'm gonna bring this back to my analogy of learning Spanish. I wouldn't be able to speak Spanish at the end of a two-day workshop, but hopefully after two days of intense learning, you get a bit more comfortable with the language and you're encouraged to take another course that's a little bit longer or explore some workflows that you find online um, and start uh, having some fun notes. Um, that's about where we're hoping to get at the end of this workshop. So as I mentioned before, this is going to be a hands-on coding workshop. So after I'm done this, uh, this presentation, I'm going to switch over my screen so that I will show my RStudio. You will have your RStudio on your machines, and we're going to type through things together. So with the document that I give you, there's going to be a lot of text and explanation. I'm not going to read all of that. That's for you to reference when you go back. And I'm just going to say things in a different way. Um, but that's more for you to reference if you want to go back to the workflow later and remember what we were doing. We also have the sticky system that we're going to use. So everyone should have your red and green stickies. As we're coding along, I'm hoping that you would uh, put your green stickies at the top corner of your laptops to let me know that you're doing, you're keeping up and everything is going well. Sometimes when we're doing exercises and activities, we're giving everyone 10 minutes to do a task. I'll ask you to put your flags down, so your sticky flags down. And then when you're done, put up your green one. Um, you also have a red. So red is something's unclear, I need help. Maybe I'm giving you a bit of code we're typing together, but it's just not working. You've tried it five times and it's still giving you issues and you need help. Rather than having to flail your arms around publicly, you can just put up your little red flags. Um, and one of our NRTs are on the lookout to see if anybody has these flags up and they'll come over and help you out. I really, really, really encourage you to use this flag system because it, if you fall behind a few code chunks, that's going to be very problematic for the next one. If there is like a larger issue that we need to handle, um, we can take some time in the breaks to just help catch you up a little bit more. Um, but if you, if you are just feeling like everything is going well, you can keep the green flags up. Um, I didn't want to put up the code of conduct as well. I think Mia had already referred to it, but I always like putting this up, especially in the beginner class. So everybody is welcome here. This is meant to be an absolute beginner course. I did notice that some of you in the pre-work survey have mentioned that you have touched R a little bit before, um, but are still a little bit hesitant executing some workflows. Just want to make sure that everybody knows that this is an inclusive, uh, respectful environment. I am asking you to learn something that is new. Many of you have expressed that it's a bit outside of your comfort zone working with a different side of biology. So it is going to be challenging, um, but we are here to support you. Please be mindful, especially when we're interacting on the online spaces like Slack. Sometimes uh, written text can come off a little bit harsher than you anticipate. 
participate. Um, but we have communication lines open there as well for support. And I believe a little bit afterwards as well. Okay. So going into the first module, this module is really gonna be the only one that I have more PowerPoint compared to uh, code along in R. R is at its core, a very high powered calculator. So R can conduct mathematical operations. Um, here is a snippet of what it looks like in the R console. So the console is a working brain of R. When we have these little arrows, these are called prompts. So those little arrows tell you that R is ready to accept code. So where you see an arrow, you'll type your line of code. So here I've typed two plus two as our input. And then when I press enter, the next line is the output that R is returning back to me. So it's done that calculation, two plus two equals four. The one in the square bracket is telling me the first item it returned to you is four. I've only asked it to do one calculation, so it only has one output to return. After I do this, then I can get another prompt. It's telling me it's ready. And this is an example of how we have objects with inherent values stored in them. So pi, pi, is a special, like has a special character, a special value in it because of the value of pi inherently. So you never want to name your own object pi, pi, or you'll override this original value. But if you just type pi and enter, it'll give you one output and the value of pi. And the reason why we want to do this and have an object-oriented language is so that we can work with it. So pi times two will give us that output of 6.28. But this is something that your calculator can probably do. We want to do more intricate things, not be confined to just the pre-stored values. So with an object-oriented language, we can make our own objects. So here I have an object named x. Inherently, if I just say x enter at the start of a brand new R um, environment, there's no value in x yet. Here, the first line, I'm storing that value of 123 into x. But notice that after that, immediately, there is no output. So when you're storing that value in an object, you're just asking it to store. If you want to double check that that's stored, you need a second command. Just put x, and then it'll give you the value of x back. So R won't talk to you every time you talk to it. It'll only give you a response if you ask for it. Is that a fire related to this response, or is it just a different problem? For, for two plus two, because I'm not storing anything, it's just giving you the output. So if you did, if you did like X put arrow two plus two, then now you've created a new object and you're storing that value in an object. But because there's no real object here for just two plus two, that four is just an output that has kind of like ended its life, really. Like the value of four is still there, obviously. But yeah, so here when I'm putting a value in an object, then that persists as like a virtual object in an environment. So I've talked a lot about environments. When we were working in R, if we start a fresh instance of R, as many of us are going to do today, the environment, or you can think about it as what R sees in the world is empty. There are some fun fundamentals like pi that are pre-made in there, but we don't have any value in X yet. And similar to the example before, we can start to interact with that object. X minus two will give us our output. The other concept that we need to be comfortable with is now objects store information. We wanna do things with those objects. We are gonna act on them with functions functions, or you might hear about them as commands. So functions are always specified by a pair of round brackets to describe what the function is acting on and how the action is carried out. So if we looked at this before, 
We know X is an object because I have this put arrow and I'm putting the value of 123 into the object X. <clears throat> but this is just one number. If I wanna store multiple numbers, I need to use a function. And this function is a very basic one named C, C for concatenate. Uh, I know that I'm kind of just like talking a lot right now. This is reiterated in the markdown file for you in just a moment. So you will have a copy of this, but feel free to take your notes right now. But don't worry if you don't have everything I'm writing, this will come to you in text form later. <clears throat> C means combine or concatenate. So string together. If I wanted to store the value of these prime numbers that I have chosen into an object called prime numbers, I'm storing information. So again, I will need that put arrow. The put arrow is only in that one direction. <clears throat> and then I wrap together all of the numbers that I wanna put in with this function of C. So I'm combining everything within those round brackets into the object called prime numbers. <clears throat> After you do that command, there is no output. I would need to print the name of the object to get that output back. Generally, you'll see a lot of commas in R. So in order to separate the values in the command concatenate, we use commas. So any of these parameters that we have within the functions, we'll separate them with commas. We don't see a lot of periods in R, and it is more common in Python, but I would encourage you not to name any of your objects with a period in it, because some languages periods hold an actual function, and that can confuse your code. So I would recommend you always just start with letters for your object names. <clears throat> so this the R is actually very generous with spaces. So what we see here is how I generally like my spaces in which I have a space before and after the put arrow. You can see my, yeah. So if you did not have the space here and did not have the space here, it would still work. If you did not have the space where my cursor is between the comma and the next number, it would still work. Um, I like I, I I tend to put more spaces in my work because I think that it helps clarify it. We'll also be going into some things in which we can add a line break in between. So if where I have my cursor right here, rather than a space, I put a line break, R will still be able to read that. I would encourage you, if you are working with other people, sit down and talk about how you want your code written beforehand to make sure that your spaces have like a similar ideology or else you're going to drive one of you insane while you're writing code together. Um, but I do gen generally have more spaces, but R is quite flexible. If you put space where my cursor is between prime and numbers, now you're making two objects. Even though you are not including the arrow. Correct. So if I, here, maybe I will do, so what I have right now, let me view, zoom. I'm sorry for the recording, but I'll, I'll, so if I did time, numbers one, two, three. This is a command, but what? Well, sorry, I move between Windows and Mac all the time. So my keyboard shortcuts are a bit of a mess. If you do this with prime space numbers, now what it's going to do is try to store the value of one, two, three in the object numbers and give you an error because it doesn't know what the object prime is. You haven't created that object prime yet, so it's gonna give you an error because it doesn't know the value of it. <clears throat> Likewise, if you if you do prime, if you do prime numbers like this and store the value of one, two, three, and then try and recall prime with a capital N, it'll say object not found. 
So cases also do matter. So for me, <clears throat> I tend to follow this system called camel hump. So between words, the first one is lowercase. So primes P is lowercase. The next word numbers starts with an uppercase N. This system is called uh, camel hump. Um, and it helps me be consistent because I always know the first letter is lowercase. The next full word is uppercase. Some people also will be more heavy with underscores. So underscores are okay. As in, if you if you do this, that is okay. But this will still give you an error message because prime numbers is not the same as prime underscore numbers. Although we understand prime numbers as an object has a meaning to us, I could also name this like pizza, right? Like there is no value of prime numbers together. The computer is just reading the string of letters that you give it. So I always tell my students, don't do that. That's very confusing and you will hate yourself later. Um, but it is case sensitive because there is no inherent meaning in the words that you're picking. Good question. After we've created objects, we can use other functions such as class and mean. So class will tell us the type of data that we have. So it's we're stored a number in there, it's numeric. If you're working with clinical data, you'll probably have characters. We'll go through all of this in a moment, so don't worry about taking too many notes now. Or running a function, rather than typing out value one plus value two plus value three over however number many number of values you have, we have preset functions for common tasks like mean. You're trying to take the mean of a bunch of numbers. There's already a pre-built function for this. Common mistake is you're gonna run into is that you don't have your brackets closed. Our studio, I'll show you how it tries to give you hints. But if you run into problems or if you don't see that little prompt at the start of the next line, that means that R thinks you're still writing the same line of code. Add a, add a bracket to that and try and close it up. Oh, no. So this second line over or this third line over here, we have an object called prime numbers. I'm asking it to give me a class. What is the class of this object? And the next line is R talking back to you, it's numbers. So that's important to you because you can only do uh, prime numbers times two if it's numeric. If you have something stored in an object such as like benign, malignant, malignant, benign, and it's gonna tell you it's a character vector, you can't do math on characters. So that's why it's important to double check the type of objects that you have. So also, if you do prime numbers and do C one, two, that's not gonna work as a numeric either, but we'll get into these kind of nuances in a moment, but great questions. So with functions, there are some that are pre-built, very basic, such as classes, class and mean, in which you use a lot. But if you're doing something like RNA-seq, you're going to need stuff that is more specialized and complex. We don't want to build that from the ground up. We can download packages, and packages are groups of function that people have put together and shared with you. Everything in R is open source, so that means if you're running a function, even a function such as mean, you can look in behind the hood and see how this mean is being run on your object if you wanted to double check. That also means you can write your own, if you do like mean two, you wanted to customize it a little bit, you can also edit the code underneath the hood. <clears throat> this is similar to how we use like phones and honestly like a lot of devices these days. So if you want a new function, which is going to be like a new app on your phone, you have to go into the app store to download it once. So in our language, we are going to have to install the package once. So today, when I introduce you to Tidyverse, we're all gonna install it together. 
But every time you use the app, you still need to open it on your phone. It's not always running in the background. So when you're starting a new workflow and you want to use Tidyverse or you want to use this new banking app that you've downloaded, you need to click on the icon. And for us at the start of our workflow, we're going to load in that library, that library, that collection of packages. So you install it once, but you still need to open it every time you, you want to use it. We'll go through this together as well. So similarly, you might need to download the apps from the store. It's going to now be in your background, but when you wanna use it, you still have to open that app. For us, we have all these different packages that are available. You need to download it and then it will become part of your local library. And when you wanna use it, you'll have to open that specific package. As a heads up, when you update R, it will make you re-download all of your libraries. <clears throat> so if you do a major update and you find things are very broken, just try reinstalling your packages. All right. So how are we actually going to work with our studio? <clears throat> You've probably seen that it looks similar to this. Don't worry if your boxes aren't in the exact same places that can be changed and we do change that for personal preference. Um, and don't worry if your colors are not exactly the same as mine because you can open up themes. So <clears throat> the console is where R is actually running. This is where your code is actually being executed. So when I'm saying two plus two enter and it does that thought of that equals four, that's being done in this console. But you'll notice quickly, even within what I'm showing you here, code has lots of lines and it's easily going to run outside of your window. And if you're trying to track back what you did 20 minutes ago, it's going to be quite difficult. So what we generally do is we have a script in another console that is like the record of our essay. This is where we're going to run all of our, or we're going to write all of our code. So if I write It'll be something like what we see over here, prime numbers, put arrow, the values. Let me make this a little bit better, just like that. <clears throat> and then prime numbers, again, as the object name. These are the lines of code that I'm writing. But notice, like, even within how I've had this, I've changed it. I've changed the values within the concatenate. I've changed the name of the objects. But this is like the final copy of what worked well. We want to save this in case we run the code again. We don't necessarily need to save all of the output. Whoops. So that's why we have our script in the corner over here and then our console. So generally what we're going to do is we're going to write code in our script or our notebook. And then I'm going to tell you to push it to the console so it's actually run through the brain of R. <clears throat> Correct. We do not save what is in the console. We save what is in the script. Our notebook is going to be a bit of an intermediate in which you'll see some output in it. Um, and that's fine. I think it's better for beginners. But you don't want to ever really save the console as just a lot of space. If you write your script properly and you're only saving what works, then technically the next time you want anything, you can reopen and just press run and you'll get your output back. But in a cleaner way, you won't have to see all the little iterations that you've changed along the way. It'll just be that final clean version. Good question. We have two other panels that are there and we won't use them as much, but um, you'll do, you will find them helpful. First of all is environment. So for example, when I'm running something like this and I've made that object prime numbers, the environment tabs will then have a record to show you we have an object called prime numbers and the value. So when you're working on a complicated long workflow, this is something that's easy for you to just refer. You don't find this in base R. This is one of the kind of like spells and sparkles that R Studio adds to help make it more comfortable in coding. And then this last panel has a lot of different tabs. Most notably, when we start plotting, your plots will show up in here if you're not using a notebook. We're using a notebook, so it's going to show us in line. Or if you need help with any of the functions, it's built in over there as well. OK, so I've talked a lot. We are going, I know we have about 10 minutes before our break, right? 
Okay, so why don't we just start exploring our studio and then we'll take our break. <laughs> 